The opening engagements of the Ameris Civil War were bloody affairs. The destruction of the home forces of the Terran Hegemony and the Star League Defense Force at the hands of Stefan Ameris had been swift and brutal. The conquest of the Rimworld's Republic too had been a bloody but short affair. Now the main campaign would begin to unfold. General Alexander Kerensky had an overwhelming force, the most powerful force in history in fact, and was now well supplied. Stefan Ameris had his own armies as well, though not as great in number. This force too was an extreme in terms of its size and power, and his supplies were still available, with his other advantage being that he simply had the large-scale manufacturing of the Terran Hegemony still largely intact, as well as entrenched positions across every Star League fortress, as well as planetary defense grids. Both sides also had other states to take into consideration, and both would play for power. But the hour of judgment had figuratively arrived. Kerensky, along with the SLDF, could not hold back. The battle would come sooner than later. During the preparation stages before the attack by the Star League, Kerensky distributed troops to strip down every SLDF facility in the inner sphere they could get their hands on, outside of the Terran Hegemony, and would send those supplies, mechs, and anything they could find over to the former Rimworld's Republic for use in the campaign to come. Volunteers from the five great houses would flock to the banner of the SLDF despite their government's neutrality. Many were civilians. Others were soldiers going AWOL to fight for a cause they believed in, believing Kerensky's crusade to be righteous and believing that the tyranny and horror they had seen in the hegemony had to be stopped at all costs. This large influx of soldiers would account for 36 regiments, which would be an immense army in any age of Battletech, further bolstering the SLDF's military advantage, at least in terms of numbers. These soldiers would be trained and equipped with mechs, infantry arms, tanks, or aerospace fighters as needed. Sadly, this passionate group of warriors would experience the highest casualty rate in the conflict to come. Agreements were offered by the Lyran Commonwealth and Federated Sons to utilize their space for moving troops and staging the attacks. This was the most support offered by any house up until this point. The Free Worlds League and Draconis Combine had offered no support, with the Free Worlds League formerly allowing some raids to take place prior, but now withdrawing its support. This was attributed due to personal issues between Kenyon Merrick I and Alexander Kerensky. The Capellans would eventually concede to allow the SLDF to move troops through their territories in the latter stages of negotiations. With three realms offering their permission to use their space, Kerensky had the needed breathing room he required to formulate his strategy of attack. Three thrusts were made into the Ameris Empire from the three houses which had agreed to assist them. They would encircle the hegemony from the outside border and squeeze the noose shut until they had Terra cut off from the rest of its resources. There were a series of reasons for this. One was there was still a distrust to the remaining neutral houses and a fear that the Draconis Combine would intervene to assist Ameris or even that the Free Worlds League may involve itself. Mercenaries had also started to flock to Ameris' banner in huge numbers, so they were no longer sure that pure numerical superiority still held firm for the SLDF. There were also issues of their opponent being entrenched and having planetary defense grids. Inevitably, a slow, cautious approach was given over a rapid strike on Terra. There is still some debate as to if this was the right move or not. We will never know, but the events would play out over the coming years. On July 14th, 2772, the beginning of the end would start. As the campaign was launched against the Ameris Empire. The Outer Worlds were inadequately defended by Ameris' forces on the Draconis Combine border. And to the surprise of some, there were indeed house forces, in fact, Draconis soldiers, on them, which retreated at the site of the SLDF, though they would return to occupy them once the Star League forces had moved on in their campaign. The attacks near the borders of the Free Worlds League and Capellan Confederation were slow, slogging, bloody affairs, taking longer than expected and having a higher rate of attrition 
as they ran into heavier fortifications, along with determined resistance. On the still more defended borders elsewhere, such as the Federated Sons and Lyran border, Amaris' forces would put up resistance, but would be washed away by their opponent's superior numbers, training, and equipment. As worlds were cleared, though, there was another thing being discovered. The signs of mass atrocities committed against occupied worlds. Every mass grave or destroyed ruin from these vile crimes embittered the already determined SLDF yet more, giving them further incentives to fight. But this would be tested by the grinding nature of the conflict as it dragged on. Sadly, despite some fast outcomes in some regions, by the end of 2774, the SLDF had only secured 11 worlds and were contesting a further 10. World by world, though, Amaris's dreams were stolen from him. Earlier in the campaign, many worlds of importance were taken and had, despite clear atrocities, been largely intact. These worlds offered supplies and benefits as staging ground. As the war dragged on, however, local populations were forced to overproduce, or were alternatively murdered or stolen from. Whole worlds would be found near starvation, or indeed starving, and anyone with any applicable military knowledge or plans were moved to Terra by Amaris' forces. Professors and other talented officials who did not have a use to the war effort were killed prior to Amaris' forces pulling back, or forced into labor preparing a planet for its defense. As a result of this, many worlds gained offered little in terms of support. If anything, the opposite was the case, as resources needed to be expended on them to support the civilian population. The ring around the Terran hegemony would be completed in November of 2774, cutting Amaris's empire off from the rest of the Inner Sphere. It's interesting to note that Kerensky, to some extent, believed this was a failed strategy, realizing that the military value had been minimal and had hoped it would have a psychological impact on the defenders. Though this wasn't widespread, it did indeed do that and impacted the most important target of all. The psychological impression it had on Amaris with his defeats on the border and with the completion of the ring around his empire, actually drove Amaris into the beginning stages of madness. With every world lost, his touch on reality lessened. With the completion of the ring, he was a danger to anyone who reminded him of Richard Cameron or General Kerensky. He would become so fear-stricken and mad, he would even be recorded saying, I can't look at the stars anymore. Every time I do, they seem to constellate the face of Kerensky. Ordering a limited withdrawal to worlds he felt had better fortifications, he hoped to bleed Kerensky's forces enough to stall or halt the assault on his remaining worlds. The only way for Amaris to win would be to use his defender's advantage and just drain the SLDF of human and material resources. Even in his maddened state, he would understand this. But he had made a strategic mistake in ordering such a broad retreat. Many of these worlds could be used as safe jump points for travel, including Bryant and Asta, which were only one jump from Terra itself. It's worth noting that the SLDF would relieve some units which had been fighting for a prolonged period, such as on Carver 5, and this would be a much needed morale boost wherever it took place. Heavy fighting would emerge in the years to come as the SLDF managed to reverse engineer and innovate a sophisticated naval ECM to help its assaults on planets to avoid parts of the automated defense systems. The resulting battles on the entrenched worlds of the Amaris Empire would cost millions their lives as Amaris' soldiers began to dig themselves in more firmly in civilian centers in a vain attempt to dissuade attacks or reduce the ferocity of those attacks. The Star League would come to take control of the systems just outside of Seoul. There would now be no escape for Amaris or his supporters. With a third of his ground forces dead and half of his fleet destroyed, Alexander Kerensky would prepare for the liberation of Terra. Operation Liberation, the code name for the capture of Terra, took many months of planning and was now being set in motion. On January 23rd, 2777, General Kerensky would watch the mustering point massing vessels for the final assault on Earth and its liberation. Twenty minutes before the mission would begin, 
he would record this message. Soldiers of the Stavro, I have a few words before we begin. We've come a long way, my friends, from the far periphery to just outside home. We have fought battle after battle. We've seen our enemy fall before us. We have seen our friends die. Now tired, bloody, and battered, we are about to enter a battle that many have said is an impossibility to win. Perhaps they are right. Perhaps freeing Terra from the usurper is humanly impossible. If it is, I'm not worried. I have long known that the men and women who it has been my honor to command are more than just flesh and blood. They are more than the sum of their physical parts. An unalloyed spirit runs through you like the sparks in diamonds. It is hard to put into words, but when I look into the eyes of even the lowest ranking trooper, I see the Star League. And I know that the worth of the Star League lies in the fact that it gave birth to and nurtured men and women like you. Friends, it is time to go home. Godspeed to all of you. The launch into the system would be destructive, as the SLDF knocked out the defense systems waiting at the jump points using pre-programmed up-armored jump ships and drop ships packed with explosives, and used them to knock out the automated defenses at the jump points. Following this, countless ships entered the system using timing to try to avoid collisions as masses of vessels piled into the region, preparing for the battle of their lives, perhaps the battle for humanity's soul even. All the warships were given orders to protect the vital dropships and to defend them at all costs as now the enormous fleet of 932 ships made their way towards the home of mankind over the coming days. It was expected for the warships to even sacrifice themselves and their crews to keep dropships on course to their destination. The war would be won on the ground. All would be given to make that happen. The defense grid of Terra operated drone warships to defend itself, and would engage the Star League fleet in a hellish battle. A forward element had been sent first, days before the arrival on Terra, and had been used to soften up the drones, with all ships lost. But they would destroy 100 of the 250 drone ships, giving the fleet its best chance to neutralize what was to come. Even with this being the case, whole wings of transports would be lost in the rapid and calculated attacks by automated defenses as it targeted the true threat to Terra. This would cause atrocious losses for ground forces but not enough to cease the operation. Two hours before arriving on Terra itself, the battle in the void had been won. The remaining transports and warships prepared themselves for what was to come on the surface below. Terra had been turned into an advanced fortress by this point, heavily dug in and with multiple lasers and missile sites for shooting down incoming vessels and aerospace assets. And this wasn't to mention the planet's not insubstantial aerospace forces as well. The SLDF would dispatch its aero assets, knowing losses would be heavy, disable or destroy these defensive positions. The attacks on these sites took place while dropships began making planet fall. There was no room for mistakes. 30 divisions would make landing, but only with extreme losses among aerospace forces. Fighting would emerge across the planet's major population centers as remnants of Ameris' forces utilized the planet's prepared defensive positions, forts, and cities, making the task of uprooting them all the bloodier. Kerensky himself would land in the second wave, and would participate in the liberation of Moscow, his home city. Dismayed at the nightmare and mockery that Stefan Ameris had turned it into, and worse, now forced him to damage and destroy to cleanse it of his forces. In the aftermath, Kerensky would notably wait several hours to accept Ameris' forces surrender after trapping them in a pocket outside the city, and decimating them with artillery bombardments and airstrikes. The final stages of the operation would take place in North America, where the best Ameris units were stationed in an attempt to safeguard the capital and their master, 
The fighting was heaviest here and had the most casualties as both sides fought over every foot of land. It was a reality that neither the defenders nor the attackers could retreat, and the only outcome either side could accept was victory, barring the most extreme circumstances leading to surrender. Massive and bloody engagements were fought in Canada as Kransky's forces tried to push from the north after establishing a beachhead towards Unity City. This resulted in the bloody clashes that took place on Vancouver Island and the coast of British Columbia through to Washington. Eventually, the Star League would break through in September of 2779, over two full years after their ships departed for Terra itself. The final battles of the campaign opened up at this stage as fighting made it to Unity City and the court of the Star League. Ameris would retreat to the Star Palace, also known now as the Imperial Palace, and his forces would fight a pitched last stand against the Star League. Alexander Kerensky and his subordinate General de Chavier would push their forces as Kerensky personally piloted his Orion into battle. Kerensky would smash through the gate himself in his battle mech. It would be a short-lived battle, where Ameris' forces would be defeated. The Emperor, Stefan Ameris, now dressed in tattered royal robes, would lay down his gemmed pistol at the feet of the Orion, surrendering. Shortly afterwards, his forces would lay down their arms at the site of his capitulation. Ameris would be well treated by the victors in the hours following the final battles, and would in turn broadcast to his soldiers to stand down and surrender. The battle for Terra was over. The Ameris Civil War, outside of the results, was done. But this would only be the beginning. With the destruction of the Terran hegemony and the fracturing of the Star League in all but name, a new series of wars would begin. The Camerons were gone, and so was their power base. Now, the five great successor states would make their own play to become First Lord. With the end of the worst war in the airspheres history up until this point, something far worse would emerge in its wake. The stage was now set for the Succession Wars. Thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. With that, I will catch you in the comments section below.